How y'all doing? Yeah, yeah y'all ready for this cool front? Yeah. I'll believe it when, it's, when I see it, but I'm excited about it. All right, well, as you know, over the last two or three weeks, violence and war has erupted again in the Middle East. And for those of you that have been around a while and keep up with the news, you know this isn't a new thing. There's been conflict involving Israel going all the way back to Bible times. But this is probably the biggest conflict Israel's been involved in in the last 50 years. And so because of that, I've had several people ask me, does this mean that the return of Jesus is soon? Well, we are wrapping up our sermon series called Thriving in Babylon, where we're working through the book of Daniel. And today we're talking about the prophecy of Daniel. But before we get to that, let's go back to the overview of this book. This is really a survival manual for exiles, right? Because Daniel was an exile. He was born in Israel, but as a teenager, he was taken hostage by the king of Babylon. He was taken back to the city of Babylon where he lived in a culture that was very different than what he was used to. And some of that culture was not very favorable to his Jewish faith in the one true God. But throughout all of that, he lived life As an exile, he retained his truth of God. He lived for God even in that hostile culture. And in the first week, we defined an exile like this. We said an exile is one who's forced into an absence from their country or home. That's what Daniel was. He was forced into exile, but he continued to live his true beliefs. He continued to live as an exile. And what we've learned is that if we're followers of Jesus, if we are really trying to live out our life to look like his, we too are exiles. This world is not our home, and sometimes it's hostile to our beliefs in the way we live and we talk. Listen to how the Apostle Peter said this in 1 Peter 2, 11 through 12. He says, dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles, there's that word, to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. So we are exiles. And so this book of Daniel is really a survival manual for us on how to live as exiles and how not to just survive in our modern day Babylon, but to how to thrive. Well, today we're wrapping up with some prophecy And we don't preach about end times prophecy a lot here at Karis City, but the book of Daniel has a lot to say about that. And so it's important that we talk about those things. Now, uh, churches should talk about end times prophecy because there's the book of Revelation. There's a lot of different prophecy from Jesus uh, involving end times. So end times prophecy can be a very, very good thing for a church. It can also be a very bad thing for a church. And I think what happens is churches sometimes bog down in the details and they get into arguments and disagreements about how much the book of Revelation should be interpreted literally or figuratively and they fight over millennial periods or not millennial periods. And that's not the point of all this prophecy. The point of this prophecy is that we are to be unified around the central truth of prophecy, that Jesus will return. See, that the how and the when are way less important. We need to be unified about this truth that Jesus will return. And, and I want to be clear about something. We didn't plan this sermon because of things going on in the Middle East. We actually planned this series and this sermon about six months ago. So it wasn't a response to war in the Middle East, but I also don't think it was an accident. God knows what a church needs to hear, but not only that, he knows when we need to hear it. So even though we didn't know six months ago this was going to happen, God did. See, God wasn't surprised by what happened in the Middle East. It wasn't like Jesus was watching the news and was like, hey, God, come come over here. you got to see what's going on in Israel. God knew it wasn't a surprise to him. I think sometimes we think things are falling apart when in reality they're falling into place. And so God wants to use these events to kind of shake us out of our slumber. I think as a church, we go to sleep. We get so confident that Jesus hasn't returned for 2,000 years, it's not going to happen anytime soon. Well, what's so cool about the book of Daniel is that Daniel doesn't just talk about end times prophecy. He prophesies about some things that were in the future for him, but are actually ancient history for us. And so we can look back at things like the rise and fall of the Persian Empire, the rise and fall of the Greek and Roman empires, That was prophecy for him, but it's ancient history for us. And we can look back and see that Daniel was very accurate in his prophecy about those kingdoms. 
And that should give us confidence that if he was accurate about things that are in the past for us, he's also going to be pretty accurate about things that are still in the future for us as well. A study of end times prophecy is called eschatology. Eschatology comes from the Greek word eschatos. Eschatos means things at the end or the final things. And so the study of eschatology is a study of the end things. In other words, Jesus' return, God's judgment on mankind, the new heaven and the new earth, all of that is part of eschatology. And so as we go through this, focus on the main thing, that Jesus will return. And that's what to keep in mind. Because we know that. Time and time again, the Bible tells us that Jesus will return. It's actually mentioned over 300 times in the Bible. Three different times in the book of Revelation, Jesus says, I am coming soon. And, and so that's what we need to understand. Revelation contains a whole lot of end times prophecy. And I think that's the book we focus on. But the reality is there's end times prophecy in lots of other places in the Bible. And most of the end times prophecy found in Revelation can also be found somewhere else. And I would actually say that you can't really begin to tackle the book of Revelation without actually looking at the book of Daniel and understand his prophecy because it plays in to all of that. Well, before we dive into Daniel, I want to give you a couple of things to keep in mind for those of you that may have not done much study in end times prophecy, is there's a couple of concepts that can be helpful. The first is when you're looking at end times prophecy, there can be some really weird imagery that seems very odd to us, like it would make us uncomfortable if we had a dream about it, we'd wake up very uncomfortable. And let's be clear, that happened to Daniel too. Look at what Daniel says in Daniel 7, 28. He says, after he had had a dream that night, he says, this is the end of the matter. I, Daniel, was deeply troubled by my thoughts and my face turned pale, but I kept the matter to myself. Daniel's saying, that was really weird. And I'm not telling anybody because if I tell somebody, they're going to lock me up and throw away the key. Another important concept about apocalyptic or end times prophecy is how literally or figuratively to interpret all of that different imagery. We have to grapple with whether or not a particular passage of prophecy is intended to be interpreted purely literally. In other words, those things are going to happen just like it says, or it's more figurative in nature and more symbolic. And there are Bible scholars that tend to interpret end times prophecy more literally, and they look at how it's going to shake out, and they look at it at just like it's written. There are other Bible scholars that see it as more figurative, and they see those things as more imagery of general concept, concepts of what to happen. But I want you to understand that the things that we're talking about today, the truths we're talking about all conservative theologians agree with. And I will tell you where theologians disagree uh, quite a bit through this. My own opinion is that we have to be very careful about reading a particular passage of Scripture as too figuratively just because it feels weird to us. I think sometimes we have a tendency to go, wow, that's really weird. I, I, that can't be the way it works. But I don't think that's true. When Jesus returns, that's going to be weird. It's going to be different than anything we've ever experienced in all of mankind. And I think about it this way. Take somebody that was living 200 years ago. Pluck them out of their time frame and put them into today. Would it be weird for them? Of course it would. They'd be confused by these big metal birds that fly through the sky and they land and eat people one place and then spit them back out somewhere else. They'd be a little confused by the people that are trapped in these rectangular boxes we have in our house. And it seems like those people aren't even aware that we're watching them or that they're trapped. They just seem to be living their lives. Or the even tinier people that are trapped in the little boxes we carry around in our pockets with us all the time. That's going to be weird for them. And, and so I want to be careful about just not dismissing things because it doesn't match with what we experience in our world. All right. With that context, let's dive into Daniel's prophecy. So if you have your Bibles or your Bible apps, go ahead and open those up to Daniel chapter 7. That's where we're going to start. We're going to bounce around a little more than normal because Daniel's prophecy is a series of dreams and visions and conversations with angels. And so we're going to look at some of that and we're going to kind of bounce around. The first seven verses of chapter seven are some visions that Daniel has about these fantastic beasts that are representative of kingdoms that have already come and gone, earthly kingdoms. 
But in verse 7, at the end, we get our first glimpse of prophecy for something that is future for us. Now, Daniel's describing a great beast with 10 horns, and that beast is almost certainly the, the kingdom of Rome, the empire of Rome. But then he talks about these horns being kingdoms, and so these are 10 kingdoms that will come uh, out of the Roman Empire. But then in Daniel 7, 8, we get our first look at a pretty significant end times character called the Antichrist. Here's what he said. While I was thinking about the horns, there before me was another horn, a little one, which came up among them. And three of the first horns were uprooted before it. The horn had eyes like the eyes of a human being and a mouth that spoke boastfully. Now, that's not real clear on what Daniel is saying, but if we look down a little further, Daniel gets an explanation of this vision that he's getting. So, look down at verse 24. The ten horns are ten kings who will come from this kingdom, the kingdom of Rome. After them, another king will arise, different from the early ones. He will subdue three kings. He will speak against the Most High. He's talking about he will speak against God and oppress his holy people, that's us, and try to change the set times and the laws. The holy people will be delivered into his hands for a time, times, and a half time. So we get some description here of the Antichrist. Now, we're going to get a lot more discussion of the Antichrist in the New Testament. And then the book of Revelation is going to talk even more about him. Now, scholars disagree about how literally the Antichrist should be interpreted. Some scholars would say that this will be an actual person who will rise to power and will convince Christians to follow him instead of the one true God. And that will also lead persecution against the nation of Israel and against the Christians. Other theologians believe that this is more figurative in nature and that the Antichrist just represents all of the false teachers and all of the false teachings that have happened since Jesus rose from the dead and will happen until Jesus returns. Well, let's keep going. In Daniel 7, verses 9 through 10, we have a pretty dramatic scene shift, and it's clear at this point that we're looking up from heaven, into heaven. As I looked, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow. The hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were open. So we get this picture of God sitting on his throne in heaven. Do you feel kind of the courtroom scene that's going on here? Very much like a courtroom. And we're going to see some of that, that imagery that I talked about. So it says that God had white robes and white hair. That is illustrative of the fact that God is a holy God. That's telling us about his holiness. And then the fire, you see the fire in his throne. That tells us that God is a God of judgment and he will judge. And then you see the river of fire coming out of the throne going into all the world. And that means his judgment will carry throughout the world. We even see that his throne has wheels. Well, that imagery is intended to tell us that, that God is an active God, that his truth, his holiness is moving throughout the world. And we see all these different things. So you can kind of see this symbolic imagery that I was talking about. Go to the book of Revelation, it's even more weird than that. But what we see here is we see thousands of angels serving God. The 10,000 times 10,000 is all of mankind that are waiting for judgment. And God opens the books, and we'll see that again here in just a second, that he uses to judge mankind. So let's look at now Revelation 20, verses 11 and 12, and compare the imagery that the Apostle John gets later to that, what, that Daniel got. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. Talking about God. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. And books were open. We see these books again. Another book was open, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. So we see a pretty good mirroring imagery between what Daniel saw and what the Apostle John saw about this moment of judgment. And we see this book of life that records the decisions that we made in this life and whether or not we followed Jesus. All right, look at what happens next. This is Daniel 7, 13 through 14. In my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. 
He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshiped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. What are we seeing here? We're seeing an image of Jesus in the Old Testament, clear imagery of Jesus, who has come to God the Father, and God gives him the authority, which is exactly what we believe. We see that in the Old Testament. And it's talking about this kingdom that will never end, that he will reign forever. This is the kingdom of heaven that he will establish. Now, I want to jump to Daniel chapter 12, where Daniel's going to get a lot more specific about end times prophecy. We're starting in Daniel 12, verse 1. At that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. There will be a time of distress, such as not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, that's us, everyone whose name is found written in the books will be delivered. There will be a time of distress. Oh, oh, I'm reading on. So what we see here is that Michael is one of the great archangels, and he's going to play some role in end times events. We don't know exactly what that is. But the second half of verse 1 is talking about the tribulation. And so we're going to see a new thing come out. This is the tribulation period that is not just in the book of Daniel, but also that Jesus talks about in Matthew chapter 24, and is also in the book of Revelation. In Revelation, we see some weird imagery for that period of time called the tribulation. Now, some theologians believe that the tribulation is a real time frame of usually about seven years, where the persecution of Israel and, and Christians will get way worse than it is now. And the Antichrist will rise to power, and he's going to mislead the nations, and he is going to have authority. There are other theologians who believe that the tribulation period is intended to be more figurative. And in fact, we live in the tribulation period. The tribulation period is describing the period from when Jesus went back to heaven until Jesus returns again. Now, and if that's the case, if this is more figurative, that would kind of make sense with what's going on with Israel right now and the attack on them. It would certainly make sense with what Israel and Jewish people went through in World War II. We don't know for sure whether it was intended to be figurative or literal, but what we do know is that the tribulation period, whatever it is, is going to be a very difficult period where we're going to live as exiles, where the nation of Israel is going to go through hardship. We're going to be outcasts. But there's good news in that as well. Look back at verse 1. You see, there will be distress, things are going to be bad, but, that's an important but, at the time of your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book will be delivered. In other words, it's going to be kind of bad. It's going to be tough. We're going to be exiles and outcasts. But then, for those of us that follow Jesus, it's going to be awesome. And that's, we look at the second half of verse 1 through verse 3, we get to see that. Look at this together. But at that time, your people, that's us, everyone whose name is found written in the book will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. When this world ends, Jesus will return, and every one of us will have eternal life. It's very clear the... the, uh, Hebrew word that's used here for everlasting is the word olam, and olam means perpetual. In other words, we will be one of two places for all of eternity. And there's a clear description here in this book of Daniel to heaven and hell. And look, I know that a lot of us have a really hard time wrapping our brains around a place of eternal suffering. And because of that, you know, a lot of people just don't believe in hell, or they believe it's not going to be that bad. I actually looked at a study that was done in 2021 by the Pew Research Center, and they found that 73% of Americans believe in heaven as a place of eternal reward, but only 53% of Americans believe in hell as a place of suffering and pain. Now, there's another 10% that actually do believe in hell, they just don't think it's going to be that bad. We like the idea of a good eternity. We like where we go and, and get to hang out and have a good time but we don't like believing in a place called hell. But here's the problem with not believing in hell. It doesn't make it any less true. It just makes us less ready because we've not really thought about that problem. Look, I don't like talking about hell. 
I much prefer to preach about God's love and his mercy and his grace. And all of those things are true. They need to get preached on. And we preach a lot about those things. But if you understand the Bible, you understand that God is also a God of justice. And Jesus makes it very clear that there is a physical place called hell. And it's a place of darkness and loneliness, suffering, unlike anything we can ever imagine. And one type of suffering will be physical pain. But that's not the worst part of hell. Let me tell you what the Apostle Paul tells us the worst part of hell is in uh, 2 Thessalonians 1, 8 through 10. It says, he will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty of his power on the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. This includes you because you believed our testimony to you. The apostle Paul is describing the worst punishment of hell. Hell is a place where God is not. God doesn't go there in any form or fashion. And we don't even really have anything to compare this to. You can be the biggest atheist around, not believe in God, and yet you get to feel the warmth of God's sunshine on your face. You, you get to look up and see the amazing night sky that he created. You get to feel the presence of God all around you through his creation of the world. Even while you deny his very existence, but not in hell. It's not a place God goes. I've heard someone say that this earth is the closest that Christians will ever get to hell. And it's the closest that non-Christians will ever get to heaven. I believe that's true. The worst punishment of hell is that God isn't there. See, Jesus talked way more about hell than he did heaven because he didn't want us to go there. For people that don't know Jesus, that don't follow him, eternity is going to be a pretty bad place. But for the exiles, for those of us that follow Jesus, we've got this amazing eternity planned out by God. Listen to the description of heaven in Revelation 21, 3 through 5. Here's what he says. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Now look at what Daniel had to say about heaven. He says in verse in 727, he says, Then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of all the kingdoms under heaven will be handed over to the holy people of the Most High. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all the rulers will worship and obey him. Pick up what it's saying there in verse 27. It's saying that we're going to rule with Jesus in heaven. I don't know what that looks like, but I think it's going to be pretty cool. What we know about heaven is that it's going to be amazing beyond our ability to even understand it at this point. You know, I love to scuba dive and snorkel. I, I love to, to go under the water and to see the, the beauty of the coral reef and all the different colors and all the different amazing uh, fish and animals that God created. And I think one of the reasons I like it so much is because what you see under the water is so different than what we see on land. But what I see when I snorkel can't come close to what we'll see in heaven. Heaven will be God's greatest work. He's been working on it for all of eternity so that we get to experience it. That eternity will be one of discovery of the beauty and the majesty of God. We get to hang out with God. We see Jesus face to face. There'll be no more tears, no divorce or abuse, no mass shootings, no evil, no war, no cancer, no heart disease, no more death. Everything will be new and it will be perfect. You know, we said through this series that we're exiles. This world is not our home. So what's the goal of an exile? Go home, right? And that's what this book of Daniel is preparing us for. It's preparing us to live out this life so that we can prepare ourselves for home. And when we see end times prophecy, that's the same thing. It's giving us a glimpse of what home looks like to encourage us to give our hearts to Jesus and to live out our lives as exiles. Well, it may makes sense then if, if the goal of being an exile is to go home 
that the last part of Daniel's prophecy is all about the timing. When do the exiles get to go home? In other words, when does Jesus return? Look at Daniel 15, 5 through 12. Then I, Daniel, looked, and there before me stood two others, one on this bank of the river and one on the opposite bank. One of them said to the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river, how long will it be before these astonishing things are fulfilled? The man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river lifted his right hand and his left hand towards heaven. And I heard him swear by the one who lives forever saying, it will be for a time, times, and a half time. We can stop right there. Sermon's over. You guys know exactly how long it is until Jesus returns, right? A time, times, and a half time. Where are your calculators? You guys not working yet? All right. Well, let's keep going. When the power of the holy people has been finally broken, all these things will be completed. I heard, but I did not understand. So I asked, my Lord, what will the outcome of all this be? He replied, go your way, Daniel, because the words are rolled up and sealed until the time of the end. Many will be purified, made spotless and refined, but the wicked will continue to be wicked. None of the wicked will understand, but those who are wise will understand. From that time that the daily sacrifice is abolished and the abomination that causes desolation is set up, there will be 1,290 days. So put that in your calculator. Blessed is the one who waits for and reaches the end of the 1,335 days. Put that in your calculator. Well, we don't really know exactly when Jesus will return. You guys have probably heard about some guys that have made a lot of noise and been very popular because they predicted the exact time of Jesus' return. They've done all of that math. And they predict a date when the world will end, and that comes and goes, and the world doesn't end. And so they say, oh, no, I made a math mistake. I forgot to carry a one somewhere. And so they come up with a new date, and then that passes too, and they were wrong again. Do you know why they're wrong? Because nobody knows. Jesus says he doesn't even know. He says only God the Father knows when Jesus will return. But because I wanted to give you some new information, I've done my own calculations. I've come up with, it's a really complex algebra. I had to stay up all night. And after doing that, here's what I can tell you for certain. We are closer today than we were yesterday. That's true. You can take that to the bank. We are. We are living in the end times. Look at what the angel tells Daniel in verse 9 that we just read. He says, he replied, go your way, Daniel, because the words up are rolled and sealed until the time of the end. Angel's telling Daniel, it's going to be a long time. You might as well roll that scroll up, put it away somewhere, because you're not living in the end times. Now, compare what the angel told Daniel to what the apostle John is told in the book of Revelation, and you see a very mirroring scripture, but there's some differences. Look at what the uh, angel tells the apostle John. Then he told me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this scroll, because the time is near. See the difference? (laughs) Went from not end times to living in end times. God is telling us through prophecy to live out our lives like eternity is tomorrow because it just might be. See, I think there's three different reactions people have when they hear an end times prophecy sermon. You got the people who are really excited. Man, they are ready for Jesus' returns. They are living as exiles. They're ready to get past this world of suffering and hurt and pain. They're excited about it. You've got another group of people who suddenly get really nervous, a little afraid, because they know they're not ready. They know if Jesus returns tomorrow, they're in trouble because they haven't prepared themselves for that moment. But you've got a third group of people who's kind of ho-hum, kind of ambivalent, right? They know Jesus is going to return someday, but it's been 2,000 years, so it's probably not going to be anytime soon. And so they can just kind of live the way they want to. I think that is the most dangerous attitude of all three. Because you are intentionally ignoring what the Bible tells you about eternity, that we do not know. You want to put it off in the future somewhere, not because you don't believe it can happen, but because you want to live the way you want to live. See, we don't know when Jesus will return. We don't. But we do know that we'll be when we least expect it. In Matthew 20, chapter 24, Jesus' disciples, they ask him specifically, Jesus, When are you coming back? When is all this going to take place? And Jesus tells them that only God the Father knows the exact time. But then Jesus gives them this warning in Matthew 24, 42 through 44. He says, therefore, keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, 
He would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you must also be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. There's Jesus referring to himself as the Son of Man like Daniel did. But what he's saying here, he's saying, look, if you knew when the thief was coming, you'd have the police waiting in your house, but you don't know that. We don't know when the thief will come, and so we lock our doors. He's saying the same thing for his return. He's saying, be ready because you don't know it's going to be when you're least expected. When my oldest daughter, Ashley, was about six years old, my wife went away for several days for work, and it was the longest that Ashley and I had been together without Lil there uh, to that point in time. I told myself it was going to be fine. It wasn't fine. It was pretty painful. Ashley really wanted her mama. And in fairness, I really wanted her to have her mama. And so we decided to, or I decided to institute a few changes in the house to make things better. So Ashley was allowed to have one soda a day. I upped that to two or or three or four. Whenever she started crying, there was another Coca-Cola there to calm her down. I also instituted a policy of cake for breakfast. I know it sounds like not good parenting, but in fairness, it was a big hit in our house. And so we didn't clean the kitchen. We didn't clean the house. Man, we just lived life, making things as good as we could, as fun as we could. And then a few hours before Lil got home, before the second coming, I rushed around, got ready, cleaned everything up. Now, the thing was, I I had a flight schedule. I knew exactly when her flight got back into Houston. I knew how long it takes to get from the airport to our house. And so I could rush around and get everything ready at the last minute. But it would have been different if she'd have said, you know, I don't know how long I'm going to be gone. I may be back tomorrow or the next day or the day after that. We probably would have lived our lives differently. We would have thought about the second coming in the way we lived our lives, right? We would have kept watch. We would have been ready. I might have had Ashley up in the bedroom with binoculars watching to see when Ashley, when Lil turned the corner to come down the street. Lives would have been different because we didn't know. And when Lil got back, when she returned, I thought I'd done a pretty good job. Everything was clean. It was ready. I was prepared. And as soon as she walked in the door, Ashley threw me under the bus. She said, Dad, I mean, Mom, Dad let me have cake for breakfast every morning. (laughs) The books were open and my deeds were unrevealed there at the second coming of my wife. There's a tendency for us to kind of put Jesus' return on the back burner, to think that it hasn't happened So it's probably not going to happen anytime soon. But we don't know when he will return. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus describes some of the warning signs about his returns. He tells us things to look for. And then in verse 30 and 31, he says, this is what it will look like when I return. You'll look up in the sky and there I'll be coming down from heaven. And so those verses are about his actual return. But in the next couple of verses, Jesus gives his disciples this really odd illustration And keep in mind, these are the next verses right after he says he will return. Look at Matthew 24, 32 through 34 together. Now, learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see all these things, you know that it is near, right at the door. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. And we kind of have to ask ourselves, what generation is Jesus talking about and what things is he talking about? And there's some disagreement among theologians about what Jesus is talking about here. Some theologians believe that Jesus is talking about when the temple in the city of Jerusalem were destroyed by the Roman Empire in 70 AD. And maybe that's what he was talking about. And if so, a lot of the people that heard these words of Jesus would have still been alive in 70 AD. And so maybe that's what he was talking about. But, but that reference is at the very top of paragraph of, of chapter 24, and there's a lot that happens after that. Uh, other theologians believe that that word for generation is more broad, and it just means mankind. And so he's saying that mankind will not pass away before Jesus returns, but that's not really a very good description of that word. You don't see it used that way anywhere else in the Bible. But from the context here, Jesus may also be referring to the generation that sees the fig tree reblossom. That the generation that sees the fig tree reblossom may not pass away before Jesus returns. So what's he talking about the fig tree? Well, in Matthew chapter 21, just three chapters before, Jesus curses a fig tree and causes it to die. And the fig tree in both the Old Testament and the New Testament is often used to represent the nation of Israel. And it's talking about how Israel 
would die. And so when Jesus cursed the fig tree, there's really no question that that was an illustration of what was going to happen to the nation of Israel because their lack of belief. Now, this is where it gets interesting. After the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD, there's about 2,000 years where Israel is not a nation. Think about that. Rome completely overthrows the nation of Israel, and for 2,000 years, they're scattered across the world. There is no nation of Israel. By that point, only historians should even remember who the nation of Israel is. But then suddenly, 2,000 years later, on May 14, 1948, Israel is established as a nation again. Is that not a miracle? 2,000 years scattered all over the world, and suddenly, on a single day, they become a nation again. Well, that fulfills a promise that God made to the nation of Israel in the Old Testament. Some set theologians would say, there you have it. This is the blossoming of the fig tree. We now have the marked moment for a generation. So if that's true, people born in 1948 would be the generation that sees the fig tree reblossom. Those people would be about 75 years old right now. My mom was born in that time frame. So is, is that what Jesus was saying? The people born in 1948 won't die before he returns? I don't know. But, but Jesus says to be ready. Keep watch. Then in 1967, Israel fought the Six-Day War and took back possession of all the city of Jerusalem. So for the first time in over 2,000 years, they now control the site of the Holy Temple and Jerusalem. And, and there are other theologians who would say, this is the reblooming of the victory. This is the moment when Jerusalem is restored. And so in that moment in 1967, that's the generation that will live to see Jesus' return. So those people would be about 56. I was born one year later, and I'm 55. So is it my generation that's going to live to see Jesus return? I don't know. But it ought to cause us to be ready when we think about those possibilities. We are living in the end times. It should cause us when we see the, the world twisting and turning what feels out of control to remember the one thing in eschatology that we know for absolute sure. Jesus will return. So be ready. If we're followers of Jesus, we live as an exile. And the goal of an exile is to go home again. We, we used to, this life to prepare for home. The journey may take longer than we think, may be more difficult than we prefer, but the end is worth the wait. Look, I, I don't know how you'll go into eternity. It, it may be when Jesus returns. It may be when you die 50 years from now or on your way home from church today. See, I, I don't know what your future in this life looks like, but I've peeked into your eternity in heaven. And if you're a follower of Jesus, it's gonna be awesome. And if you're not, it's going to be pretty terrible. We get this one opportunity, this one lifetime to make the decision to trust Jesus with our lives, to make him our Lord and Savior. Don't miss out on making the decision that will change everything. I, I love the very last verse of the entire book of Daniel. This is chapter 12, verse 13. This is the very last verse. This is talking to Daniel here, and it says, As for you, Daniel, go your way till the end. You will rest, and then at the end of days, you will rise to receive your allotted inheritance. That's the promise that was made. You're in exile, but one day you'll be home. End times prophecy makes that same promise to us as exiles. It's telling us, follow Jesus. Be courageous, be strong, stay true. Don't give up, because we will go home. Let's pray.